Hey, what's good with it, YouTube? Man, it's your boy Rojo, the convict's perspective. And, you know, like the title says, man, today we're going to talk about old Ronald Lucky Shelton and his demise. Some people have asked me, you know, about his story and whatnot and, you know, things of that nature. So I was fortunate enough to come across um, from a viewer a good piece of information. And, uh, you know, it's public knowledge. You know, it's easy to find. But, uh, man, I found a real good detailed, you know, story of what went on with him what went on with him and uh it's from the court of appeals in the sixth sixth district of california and this is basically where you know he just he just told everything man this is when he gave up man and uh he testified against a uh, individual named edward vargas amongst other people but edward vargas was the subject of the investigation man but i'm gonna break it down for you guys man this defendant edward vargas was charged by a grand jury Indictment with conspiracy to commit murder, robbery, assault with a deadly weapon, arson, burglary, extortion, intimidation of witnesses, terroristic threats, escape, possession of a concealed firearm by a convicted felon, and the distribution of heroin, cocaine, PCP, and methamphetamine. <laughs> oh boy, it was busy, huh? As well as, more importantly, the murder of Elias Rosas. Count one alleged over 96 overt acts. The indictment further alleged that counts one through 12 were committed for the benefit of, at the direction of, an association with a criminal street gang with the specific intent to promote further and assist in criminal conduct by gang members within the meaning of section 186.22. The indictment was amended on July 8th, 1996, to add the allegation that the defendant had suffered two prior felony convictions. The defendant pleaded not guilty and denied the enhancement allegations. The jury found defendant guilty on both and also found true the enhancement allegations. The court sentenced the defendant to a total term of 60 years to life as follows. 25 years to life on count 1 and a consecutive 25 years to life on count 12 and a consecutive 10-year enhancement for the two prior felony convictions. The facts of the case are, A, the Nuestra Familia is a prison gang that was founded in September 1968 by inmates at the California State Prison San Quentin. NF is a cold-hearted gang that commits murders, burglaries, extortion, and other crimes, including selling drugs to raise money for its members. Person who testify, persons who testify against the NF are killed. Since its founding, the NF has become the most organized prison gang in California, according to the California Department of Directions. Corrections. NF has also, since its founding, extended its influence outside of prison walls into the streets. The NF has a written constitution. The governing body of the NF is called the MESA. New NF members receive schooling on such topics as how to construct weapons, from found materials, how to attack an enemy and how to build the gang outside of the prison. To be eligible, now this is a false one right here, you know, this is how the, the feds and prosecutors get this stuff mixed up. To be eligible for NF membership, a prisoner had to be a member of the Northern Structure. That's, that's not accurate. NF membership is a lifetime commitment. Leaving the NF is, according to its constitution, an offense punishable by death. Of this lifetime commitment, Ronald Shelton, an NF member who testified for the prosecution, stated, Blood in, blood out is not written literally into the Constitution word for word, although between the lines it is definitely there that you come into the organization with blood on your hands, preferably murder, if not other criminal acts and, for example, a deserter, traitor, or coward who decides to defect and leave the organization, blood out is meaning to kill him. Shelton further testified that although the Constitution provides for an automatic death sentence for a traitor, i.e. an NF who decides to defect drop out of the organization, in practice there was discretion. Shelton said he could be considered a traitor because he had defected in his testifying. Asked if his defection meant a death sentence, Shelton stated, yes, if they ever had an opportunity to get near me, they pretty sure some would try to kill me. Now, I know this isn't correct English. This is exactly what this individual said um, in the grand jury. Um, some would try to kill me. And perhaps maybe some wouldn't. It's not carved in stone to kill because it's upon the individual if he wants to proceed and pursue the hit or just back off because maybe he just doesn't want to do nothing. Maybe he's on the verge of dropping out. 
One objective of the NF is to build the organization on the outside to become a strong self-supporting work to become strong self-supporting. Work with those in alliance, any and all illegal ventures to build the funds that can be utilized to take care of members behind the walls or drug deals on the streets. Building the organization on the streets was important to promote the organization so others could recognize the powerfulness of the NF, which is basically the umbrella organization for the Northern structure, and in sense directly, indirectly, intimidate those with large quantities of drugs or anything the NF can use to edify their own system. Mm, not quite. NF members on the streets were expected to contribute money to the NF bank which was the NF fund held for the benefit of the NF members. The, contrib the contributions from individual members were to be made from dealing drugs or getting contributions from drug dealers. Extortion. The NF members on the street were under the control of the, reg the Regional Security Department, RSD, to whom they re were to report. Murders or hits had to be sanctioned by higher authority. In NF terminology, approval for a murder was called a green light. An NF member who killed another NF member had to be killed. Now, that's not necessarily always true. You can kill another person if that's the orders. Like, if you kill... Like, they, they, they word it real funny here, but if you take it upon yourself to do something without the proper approval, you know, which has happened a lot, and which has just happened very recently, yeah, I mean it's all bad for you but when it's said that you can be dealt with you can be dealt with b northern structure the northern structure was formed by the nf as a gang under them to take the heat off the nf nf was superior to ns nf and ns operated for the common purpose of raising money through crimes to help nf members who are in prison and their families NF and NS did not use terms like kill or murder in discussing those acts. They instead used language such as dealt with for murder to conceal the subject of discussion from eavesdroppers. Like, like you can't figure out, you know what I mean? C1, Ronnie Shelton. In May of 1985, Shelton, while serving time in San Quentin, was recruited to the NF by NF member Michael Sosa. Shelton had been a member of the NS prior to his entry into the NF. In December of 1990, Shelton became the RSD for San Jose. After his indictment, Shelton decided to leave the NF and testify for the prosecution. Among the reasons Shelton cited for his decision were exhaustion and the fact that the NF wanted to control his defense. Shelton was facing the death penalty for the murders in which he participated. Shelton pled guilty to four first-degree murders, i.e. the murders of Herrera, Valle, Apodaca, and Perez. For these murders, Shelton received a total prison term of 100 years to life. Shelton was 35 years old when he testified. Shelton said he did not expect to live long enough to be eligible for parole, and that his participation in the four murders he deserved to be in prison for the rest of his life. C2, Louis Chavez. Chavez was recruited into the NF from NS in 1989 at the Tehachapi State Prison by Joseph Fernandez and Vincent Arroyo. Chavez knew defendant while both of them were at Tehachapi. After the murders of Herrera, Rosas, Baca, and Baca, co-defendant Lopez told Chavez that Chavez's status in the NF was on freeze until Chavez brought them a body, i.e. committed a murder. Chavez says this meant that if he didn't take care of business, they were going to take him out. Chavez agreed to testify for the prosecution on condition that he be prosecuted only for the crimes that he had actually committed. Number three, Jerry Salazar. Salazar was recruited into the NS when he was 18 years old. Salazar should have been sent to the California Youth Authority, but because he had been paralyzed from a car accident that happened to him when he was 16 and had been confined to a wheelchair, Salazar could not be accommodated at the CYA. Instead, Salazar was sent to the CDC. As part of the NF recruitment process, Salazar was given secret documents that explained the NS and contained the 14 bonds basically the do's and don'ts of that organization. Salazar was active in the NS from 87 to 93. Salazar, Salazar joined NF while he was in custody on the present charges. In 1993, while in a holding cell with Arroyo, Salazar was told by Arroyo that he, Arroyo, knew that Salazar had spoken with the San Jose Police Department, but that Salazar should not worry because he, Arroyo, was going to let it slide because as long as Salazar didn't give nobody up on a murder. Salazar, in violation of the NF's code of silence, had told the San Jose police in 1992 that Guzman, Shelton, 
Villanueva, and co-defendant Lopez were members of the NF. After the 93 conversation with Arroyo, Salazar overheard co-defendant Trujeque tell co-defendant Serna that they would let Salazar slide for a while and then kill him. In 93, Salazar, in a written plea agreement, agreed to testify for the prosecution with the understanding that the prosecution would decide whether a sentence was to be life without the possibility of parole or 50 years to life. C4, Anthony Guzman. Guzman joined the NS while in prison in late 1987 or early 88 after reading the gang's 14 bonds and agreeing to live by them. In August of 92, Guzman flew to Mexico to avoid arrest on the indictment. Guzman's wife, who was also indicted, joined him but later returned to the United States. Back in the U.S., Guzman's wife told Guzman in a telephone conversation that the NF wanted to kill him because they believed that he was cooperating with the district attorney. Guzman explained that he decided to testify for the government because people had died for nothing. He was facing the death penalty, his wife was indicted, and his children were upset. C5. Uh, Mendoza, Saldivar, and Arroyo. Other NF members who testified for the prosecution were Carlos Mendoza and Roland Saldivar. NF men member Vincent Arroyo pled guilty pursuant to his plea agreement but did not testify. Uh, conspiracy, some overt acts, the NFA list, etc. While at Tehachapi, Chavez Hernandez and Pablo Panther Pena prepared to prepare the NF hit list, which was a list of persons who should be killed by the NF for various reasons. Among the people in the list were Tony, Little Weasel Herrera, and James Jocko Esparza, both for being gang dropouts, and Carlos Mejia for having an NF member stabbed. Eli Rosas was not on the list. When Chavez was paroled, he took the hit list with him. Chavez was to give the hit list to Cervantes, but did not. Instead, on July 25, 91, Chavez gave the hit list as well as an NF membership list to his parole officer, E.J. Allen, when Chavez was a regional security director, D2. While Chavez was in prison, he was ordered by NF Mesa member Hernandez to organize the NF San Jose Regiment. Chavez was to work on the NF's bank. Hernandez told Chavez to organize it, you know, get it together and maintain it by dealing drugs and robbing connections. Chavez was to report by letter to Hernandez, who was still in prison, on matters relating to the NF. When Chavez was released on parole April 19th of 90, he was made RSD for San Jose. In violation of Hernandez's orders, Chavez did not report to Hernandez and did not execute his assignment as directed. Chavez did sell PC PCP but did not put the proceeds into the NF bank. The Attempted Murder of Mejias Chavez testified that Carlos Mejia was not a member of the NF. In 1990, the NF wanted to kill Mejia because Mejia, while in prison, had ordered the murder of an NF member, which was carried out. Salazar testified that at a barbecue prepared by his mother and Kelly Park in San Jose on July 4th of 90, Chavez and another NF member, Lencho Guzman, were present. Victor Sleepy Esquibel, who had no gang affiliation, was also present. Although not invited, Mejia showed up. Chavez, who knew that NF wanted Mejia killed, ordered that Mejia's murder be carried out. Salazar, upon Chavez's directions, provided a knife. When Mejia left, Guzman and Escobel left with him. Guzman and Escobel returned about 30 minutes later and told Salazar that Mejia had been killed. In fact, Mejia survived and was treated for his wounds. Shelton replaces Chavez as the RSD. Shelton testified that while he was in prison, he was instructed by the NF leadership to maintain upon parole the spirit of NF and get things organized and make sure there was a regiment established. Shelton was paroled to San Jose on May 27, 1990. In September of 1990, Andrew Mad Dog Cervantes, who was from Stockton NF Regiment, called a meeting of the San Jose NF members at the home of Lisa Cuevas. Among NF members present were Shelton, Chavez, and Lopez. Trujeque was not present when the meeting started, but arrived later. The meeting discussed subjects like weapons, who in San Jose had drugs they could steal, and the need for members to keep in communication with NF leadership. Toward the end of the meeting, Cervantes promoted Shelton to RSD and demoted Chavez to second-in-command. Lopez becomes second-in-command. Lopez was paroled on September 17, 1990 and became second in command to Shelton by December of 90. Shelton testified at the NF meetings held in December 1990. We would discuss who was in communication, who had weapons, drugs, people that needed to be killed, people that had drugs and we wanted perhaps for them to pay rent, a percentage to the organization, things of that nature. 
Lopez was arrested for parole violation in May of 91. While in jail, Lopez made Salazar RSD for San Jose. At a meeting at the house of Salazar's mother in June of 91, Rosas, who had just been paroled and who was in charge of security while in prison, believed that he, not Salazar, should be running the streets. Salazar told Rosas that Lopez placed him in charge and that was it. While defendant was paroled in the spring of 1991, Lopez told Salazar from jail to meet defendant. In June of 91, the defendant took over control of the NF in San Jose. Chavez told Trajeque that defendant was now in charge of the San Jose NF regiment. At Lopez's direction, Salazar turned over to defendant the NF bank containing between 2,000 and 2,500. Defendant subsequently spent money on beer, barbecues, and partying. Defendant made Salazar the head of security, which was the second highest position under the RSD. The defendant was arrested in early 1991. With defendant's arrest, Salazar took over the streets. In mid-July of 91, Serna was paroled. Upon Lopez's direction from jail, Serna took over the San Jose Regiment from Salazar. Serna testified that Lopez had directed him to start talking, to taking care of business out there and start building up the bank again and to rob connections. Now, the murder of Herrera. At an NF meeting in November 1790, attended by, among others, Shelton, Lopez, and Trujeque, the NF decided to kill Herrera, a major drug dealer. Herrera had been placed on the NF hit list. John Blanco, a prominent San Jose drug dealer who was present at the meeting, said that Herrera had told the police about his activities. Shelton, who had earlier opposed the killing of Herrera because Herrera was assisting the NF by dealing drugs, volunteered to carry out the murder, explaining that the RSD had to set an example. On November 19th and 90, two days after the meeting, and before Herrera's murder could be carried out, Villanueva, an NF member who was to participate in Herrera's murder, was arrested. Villanueva called Shelton from jail, saying that he believed Herrera had told the police about him. On November 20th, 1990, Shelton met with Lopez to plan Herrera's murder. Lopez was to obtain a gun and Betsy Spencer's Chevette. Shelton, Lopez, and Trujeque discussed the need to kill witnesses. Trujeque suggested that they dump Herrera's body in a park. Later that day, Shelton, Lopez, and Trujeque met Herrera and asked Herrera to go inside Spencer's Chevette. When Herrera was inside the car, Trujeque displayed a 38 caliber revolver. Trujeque got out of the car, pointed the gun at Herrera, at Herrera and pulled the trigger twice. The gun did not fire. <coughs> Excuse me. Herrera got out and started to run. Lopez tackled Herrera. Shelton shot Herrera six times in the head. Trujeque fired his gun again. After more misfires, the gun went off. Spencer testified she suspected her Chevette was involved in Herrera's murder because on Thanksgiving Day, several days after Herrera's murder, after Herrera's murder, it was discovered on fire. Spencer testified that Lopez had borrowed the car and had told her that the car was stolen from him when he parked it at a 7-Eleven store with the keys in the ignition. D7. First attempt to kill Hassel. The NF made two attempts to kill Robert Hassel, a bouncer at JP's bar in San Jose who was not a member of either the NF or the NS. The first attempt was in the spring of 91 and the second was in the fall of that year. In December of 90, an NF member reported to Shelton that at Herrera's funeral, Joshua had said, F. Lucky Shelton, F. Lucky, I know that Lucky killed Herrera. Shelton took Hassel's statement as a show of disrespect to him in the NF. Shelton directed Lopez, his second in command, to have Hassel killed, adding that he wanted all, F men all NF members to know that Hassel was to be killed. Sh Shelton said that to let Hassel's disrespect to the NF pass would cause uh, diminish, diminishment of the NF's power and people would just not be willing to cooperate with drug transactions on a respectful on a respectful level. Hassel's murder was further discussed at the NF meetings in December of 90 and April of 91. Lopez, Robert Rios, Jason Vasquez looked for Hassel in late winter or early spring to kill him. However, when they found him, they could not kill him because there were police in the area. In the area. Murder of Ayes. Larry Viaz was a PCP dealer. At one F meeting, the NF discussed the need for Viaz to kick down drugs to the gang. It was decided that Viaz needed to be jacked up. Shelton subsequently arranged a meeting with Viaz. Shelton arrived first. After Viaz arrived, Lopez also arrived. Out of Viaz's presence, Shelton and Lopez discussed the extortion they were going to make. Viaz told Shelton and Lopez that he did not pay rent. Shelton shot Viaz between the eyes. The attempted murder of Urango. Lopez authorized the murder of Alfonso Weto Urango because Urango disrespected the NF by not returning two guns which belonged to the NF. 
Urango said he would trade the guns for a gram of PCP. Salazar testified that Urango's offer was an automatic green light. Salazar talked with defendants about Urango's murder. In late June or early July of 91, NF members including Salazar, Mendoza, and defendant went to Urango's apartment to kill him. When they arrived, defendant told Salazar and Mendoza to go to the apartment door, knock on it, and shoot Urango when he opened the door. When Saldivar and Mendoza knocked on the door, Urango's girlfriend, who was eight months pregnant, answered the door. Saldivar and Mendoza did not have the guts to kill Urango under the circumstances. No further attempts were made on his life. The Murder of Rosas Rosas was a member of the NS. On December 31st of 83, two masked men broke into the home of Petra Gonzalez, who was the mother of Rosas' girlfriend. Rosas went to Gonzalez's defense. After the Gonzalez robbery and while Peña was in prison with Chavez, Peña told Chavez that he had robbed Rosas' home, taking drugs. Peña further told Chavez that he, Peña, believed that Rosas snitched on him. Chavez stated that even though Rosas was the victim, Rosas should not have told the police because Peña was a member of the NF at the time of the robbery and Rosas was not. In June of 91, after defendant was paroled, the defendant discussed with Rosas mat the Rosas matter with Salazar. Defendant told Salazar that there was a green light on Rosas because Rosas had snitched on Pablo Peña, Panther. However, defendant wanted to get some confirming paperwork first because if he defendant was wrong and Rosas was killed, he defendant would be killed. Defendant told Salazar that the NF was not to hunt down Rosas to kill him, but if the NF member should run across him, Rosas should be killed. On the night of Rosas' murder, Chavez received a telephone call from Albert Reveles and Tim Hernandez. Reveles? Reveles? Hernandez told Chavez that he was at a home where Rosas was running his mouth about Chavez, saying that Chavez was to be hit by the NF. Hernandez asked Chavez what should be done to Rosas, saying he wanted to kill Rosas. Chavez told Hernandez he did not have the authority to authorize the murder of Rosas because the defendant was in charge. Chavez contacted Salazar, who set up a three-way telephone conference with the defendant. In that telephone conference, the defendant approved the murder of Rosas, saying, Do what you gotta do. The defendant also told Chavez that he had the authority to call the hit. Hours later, Hernandez called Chavez to report that Rosas has been killed. Subsequently, the defendant told Shelton at San Quentin that Rosas was behind some drug deal, that some drugs were involved, and Rosas supposedly had snitched on Peña, who's also an NF member. Defended and admitted to Shelton that he defended had called the Rosas hit. The order to kill Esparza. Esparza was on the NF hit list that Chavez and Peña had compiled in 1990. Salazar testified that defendant had ordered him to kill Esparza. Defendant told Salazar that Esparza was in trouble because Esparza was claiming that he was a member of the NS and he was not. Salazar did not carry out defendant's order because he believed that the defendant had a personal thing on Esparza concerning the defendant's girlfriend. The plot to kill Chavez. Shelton testified that after conferring with Lopez, he, Shelton, decided that Chavez should be killed. Lopez had written Shelton that Chavez's status was on freeze until he, Chavez, brought a body to the organization, meaning he needed to kill somebody and, and prove himself. In August of 91, Shelton began plotting Chavez's murder. In September of 91, while Shelton and the defendant were in prison, Shelton asked the defendant why Chavez was not dead yet. The defendant told Shelton that he wanted to kill Chavez himself because he had not yet committed a murder for the NF. Chavez testified that Smiley Joe Ramirez had told him that the NF wanted to kill him. Chavez. The murder of Esteban Guzman. Salazar testified that in July 91, Cerner called to say that he was bringing drugs for Salazar to sell. When Cerner arrived, he told Salazar the drugs belonged to a border brother, i.e. Mexican national, whom he'd robbed. Cerner said he shot the drug owner with a shotgun and left no witnesses. The victim turned out to be Esteban Guzman. Anthony Guzman testified that after the murder trial of Esteban, that after the murder of Esteban Guzman, Cerna told him that he, Cerna, killed Esteban because Esteban, Esteban was a member of a rival gang. Esteban had died from a gunshot from a shotgun wound to his chest. The murder of Baca. Salazar testified that Cerna had told him that he, Cerna, had killed Marcos' puppet Baca with a 22 caliber revolver because Baca was a police informant. Anthony Guzman also testified that Cerna had admitted to him that he and two others had killed Baca with a 22 caliber revolver because Baca was no good and that he was giving up people in the county jail. Guzman, who was a superior to Cerna in the NF, told Cerna not to kill anymore because he, Guzman, did, want, did not want to be responsible. The murder of Sheila Apodaca. 
Sheila Apodaca at one time was Lopez's girlfriend. On December 30th of 90, Shelton met Apodaca. The next day, Apodaca gave Shelton a ride. During the ride, Apodaca brought up the subject of Herrera's murder. Apodaca said she believed Shelton and the others were crazy. Shelton told Lopez about his conversation with Apodaca. Lopez told Shelton not to worry because Apodaca did not know what was going on. While Lopez was in prison, he wrote Shelton saying that he thought Apodaca might tell the police what she knew about the Herrera and Valles murders and that Apodaca should be killed. August 26 of 91, at an NF meeting at Guzman's apartment, Apodaca's murder was discussed. Shelton explained that he, Serna, and Salazar all wanted to kill Apodaca. The next day, Shelton and Guzman were arrested. From the county jail, Shelton sent Lopez a message saying that the Perez and Apodaca murders were still on. Salazar testified that Apodaca was to be killed because Lopez had learned that Apodaca was going to tell the police about Lopez's involvement in the Herrera murder. Lopez called Apodaca a snitch bitch. Subsequently, Salazar arranged a meeting with Apodaca at Mount Pleasant High School. Salazar then told Serna and Trujillo to proceed to the meeting place. Salazar observed Serna handling a three fifty seven caliber revolver to make sure there were no fingerprints on the bullets. When Serna and Trujillo went to the appointed place, Salazar stayed behind, nervous from knowing that he had set up Apodaca to be murdered. When Serna and Trujillo returned, um, Salazar told, Serna told Salazar that he, Serna, had shot Apodaca twice in the head. The murder of Perez. Lopez told Shelton that Ray Chocolate Perez was giving him a hard time and being irresponsible and was losing drugs. Lopez said that Perez, who was not an NF member, was disrespecting him. Lopez wanted to kill Perez, but Shelton asked Lopez to wait. When Lopez was in prison, Lopez wrote Shelton saying that Perez should be killed because Perez was talking to law enforcement. Perez's murder was discussed at the same NF meeting in which Apodaca's murder was discussed. On August 29th and 91, Salazar met with Trujillo in Mendoza. Salazar volunteered to lure Perez to a meeting and accompanied Trujillo and Mendoza to that meeting. When they arrived at that meeting place, Perez came up to the window of their car and spoke with them. When Perez got in the car, the foursome drove off. When the car stopped, Salazar shot Perez. Salazar explained that this was his first murder he committed for the gang. The second attempt to murder Hasso. Salazar testified that Shelton and Lopez authorized the murder of Hasso because Hasso was disrespecting the NF. Hasso was a close friend of Herrera and was kind of pissed off because the NF killed Herrera. In late August and early September 91, Santos' bad boy Bonias, an NF member called Salazar, who was in Utah, and told him to return to San Jose because the NF had to take care of Hasso. When Salazar returned, he, Bonias, and Joey Gonzalez went to JP's bar in Gonzalez's Jeep. When they saw Hasso, Bernias got out of the Jeep saying he would be back. Within five minutes, Bernias was back. Bernias told Salazar and Gonzalez that he had just shot Hasso three times. Bernias later admitted Shelton that he had shot Hasso saying he was taking, he was just taking care of business. Hasso survived the assassination attempt. He was treated for gunshot wounds to his shoulder and head. Now, now that's a lot of telling, man. You got Shelton, you got Chavez, you got Salazar, man, you got all kinds of people in this in this uh in this case, man. But uh yeah, there there was a whole lot to this one, man. But that's that's the breakdown of uh people you were asking about Lucky Shelton, man. That's that's when he decided to cooperate, that was it for him, but he was a vicious dude, man, you know. Not only was he willing to put the green light on people and, and you know, deem people, whatnot, he was willing to put in that work himself, and, you know, I don't understand when people already have these hundred-year terms and stuff, what the point is of cooperating, you know what I mean, but, uh, that's what it boils down to, man, it's, even, even the people that are most with the business, sometimes they'll just flip out of nowhere, you know, and, and, you know, sometimes the people that everybody think, man, he ain't nobody, he, he's, he's soft, they never tell, it, it's, it's, it's a weird game, man, it's a weird animal, man, but, uh, all this stuff just leads to, to prison and death, man, this is another example, it's like, look at how many people were murdered in this whole situation, look at how many people got the death penalty, look at how many people told, look at how, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, and it's just out there putting in that work, and, you know, there's, 50 lives ruined out of this case man but 
Anyway, you guys asked about Lucky Shelton, man. I just found a thing about that, man. We got some extras with, with Dump Truck and, and Crippled Jerry and, you know, etc. And, you know, it also talked about some of them cases where, where Lopez, Trehecki, and Cerna got the death penalty. You know what I mean? And, uh, man, it was crazy times in the early 90s, man. That was the first big one, for sure. All right, YouTube. It's your boy Rojo. I'm out of here. I hope you guys were able to follow that. Appreciate you, and I'll see you tomorrow.